Luke chapter 18 tonight, if you'll turn there with me. Luke chapter 18, and we'll start in verse 18. In verse 18, in this section of Luke's gospel, uh, Jesus has just been uh, teaching through several different parables about discipleship, about following him. In this particular section, we have what we would call the rich young ruler. Now, this particular recording of this instance does not say uh, young. Uh, Mark and Matt or Matthew both uh, want to both record that for us in their parallel passages. But this, ver uh, this section starts off with verse 18 and says, And a ruler asked him, and the him there is Jesus, Good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And that is uh, why we've entitled tonight, None Good But God. Now as we start the passage tonight, we really do want to see that uh, none is good but God alone. None no one is good but God alone. We all, especially in our day and age, as maybe even more conservative people in many ways, can think we're pretty good. We can think, oh, well, I don't do the things that those people do. But according to the Bible... Jesus being called good, and there's an inference here that he is good, and thus he is God. But Jesus answers this, this young man, this ruler, this one who has power, with no one is good but God alone. And if we don't challenge our own perceptions that we are pretty good with the truth of the Bible, then we will be much like this young man. And it's interesting because the young man here unknowingly is proclaiming the truth that Jesus is good. You ever say something and not even realize that you were profound? I say a lot of things I think are profound and realize later they were not at all. Here's a young man, this young ruler, and he asked, he asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's got a serious question. But in doing so, he unknowingly proclaims Jesus as good and Jesus response is why do you call me good if the only one who is good is God this young ruler would have known such a thing God in his even giving of the Ten Commandments says there is no one like me in the book of Isaiah when God's people have gone astray God displays his uniqueness we have another word for that, his holiness. There's no one like God. No one has goodness. God is the only one who is good. And this young man comes, this ruler, good teacher. And he says something profound, unknowingly, that Jesus is good. And the implication here then is Jesus is God. But he comes with a question, right? Is it rabbi, teacher? Rabbi is teacher, yep. Some translations will have a uh, good rabbi or some other, some of the other instances in the Gospels people will come up with and ask rabbi. But this young man has an important question, doesn't he? What must I do to inherit, or we could say gain, Health and wealth, is that what he asks? 
eternal no. life. Eternal life. That's more than health and wealth. That is very good, Miss Amy. Eternal life. He has questions. This young man has questions concerning eternal life. You would think of all the people, shouldn't he know? He's a leader. He's a ruler. Shouldn't he in a state who is under Roman oppression, but who claims to know the one true God? Don't you think he should have some answers? Maybe even like another gentleman who comes to Jesus by night. We know him as Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Are you not a teacher of Israel and don't you know these things? Haven't you picked up on it, Nicodemus, from the Old Testament? But just like everybody else, this ruler has been blinded to God because his religion has gotten in the way. His self-importance, even as we'll see tonight, most especially his wealth. We ask questions. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a pretty big and important question. And the rule asked him, verse 18 and 19, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And in this question on eternal life, we have to ask ourselves, what, what is eternal life, right? We use terms like this all the time, don't we? We read our Bible. I hope you read your Bible. And we read things like this. We read things like the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And we can think of it very simply in terms like this. He's asking Jesus, how do I have life without end? In the very presence of God. How do I get to the point of where the relationship with God is restored to the way it was for Adam and Eve before they sinned? Genesis records for us that God came and walked and talked with Adam in the cool of the day. And that's what uh, God is doing when... Adam and Eve are hiding. Eternal life. Good teacher, how do I get life without end in the presence of God instead of life without end and separation from God? Not only that, but we'll see in this passage a reference to the kingdom of God in verse 24. It's the same thing. Now, the kingdom of God also has this aspect of God's rule and reign and is looking more specifically in that direction than our eternal life. But if God is ruling and reigning, I think I want to be there instead of separated. And he asks, good teacher... Why would you call me good? The only one who's good is God. The only one who has power of souls and of life and death is God. How do I inherit eternal life? How do I gain this for myself? How do I gain it? Because this young ruler is coming to Jesus and he realizes... He's got something missing. He's looking for eternal life. That is life without end in the presence of God. And life in the future dwelling in the kingdom of God. And experiencing all the joy that is to come when God's reign is fully realized. Not that he's impowerful now. But it will become more evident because sin will be no more. In fact, verse 24 says, Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, as the ruler said, how difficult is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? 
to have life eternal without end. You see, there is no one good but God alone. And in unknowingly proclaiming the truth, Jesus is good. What he's saying is that the only good one, God, is Jesus. Jesus doesn't take him to task and say, I'm not good. What does he tell him? The only one who is good is who? God, God right? He didn't say my father. He didn't say my father. My father didn't say that. It's God. And then we have, you could put in a nice little ellipsis there. Dot, dot, dot. I am God. John chapter 1, we've referenced that a lot. Colossians chapter 2 is another great passage. Jesus is God. Here, a young man, a ruling man, a man with power and authority, comes to Jesus and says, I need life eternal. How do I get that good teacher? And knowingly says, there's only one who is good. Hey, Jesus, you must be God. How do I get life eternal? And the ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And when we see these two uses here, or three uses, excuse me, of good. It's a particular word in the New Testament, in the original Greek. And it can have these usages. The first one, can, it des describes true, positive, moral qualities. Another use is talking about meeting a high standard of quality, but that use is usually applied to things. I have a good rake. But the use here primarily is describing meeting a high standard of worth and merit. Who does the Bible over and over and over and over again say deserves worth because of his unfathomable merit. In fact, the Psalms call us to ascribe worth to him. Leviticus and Deuteronomy detail specifics on how Israel is to describe worth to him. That one is God. And part of his merit, his unsurpassing merit, is that he is the true standard of positive moral qualities. In him is light and there is no turning or variance. He is the one who the angels rightly covering themselves cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Because there's no one good. But God, now we think all too often, I'm, I'm pretty good, right? I didn't get caught speaking today. I'm pretty good. But there's no one good by God. Especially when it comes to measuring by positive moral qualities. Here's the answer Jesus gives to the young man. Verse 20. You know the commandments. What are they? Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he, the young ruler, said to back to Jesus, All these I have kept from my youth. Hey, Jesus, I'm perfect. Okay, thanks for the list. I'm good. Mm -hmm. 
When Jesus heard this, his reply, Jesus said to him, One thing you still lack. So all that you have, distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he be, that as the ruler, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Here's the standard. Here's the moral standard. Keep all the commandments. And I don't know about you, but I've kind of, I get lost right in the top ten there. Even the ones Jesus quoted. Anyone here born false witness? I'll claim that one. Coveted? Yeah, I've done that one too. Stolen? Yeah, I've done that one too. You know I was a sinner, did you? Only a sinner saved by grace. Keep all the commandments. You don't want to, You want to know how good, good God is? He's never broken his commandments. Jesus never broke the commandments either because he is God as well. Keep all the commandments. That's a pretty high standard for attaining good, isn't it? That's pretty high. That's up there with another word that we would see in the, the New Testament. Perfect. Complete. What, you, what we see, though, is here's a list of commandments. And did you notice that there are others focused in verse 20? Verse 21. You know the commandments. What? Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. Those are all outwardly focused. That's kind of from the second half. Did you notice one that was missing? And the young man replies, I've kept all these from my youth. And therefore, he has a false sense of goodness and righteousness, right? Paul, one of the most prolific writers in our New Testament, even based on God's law, says about himself prior to salvation, perfect concerning the law, that is where he had sinned, he had done the appropriate sacrifice to have it covered. I'm not sure which bull or which uh, pigeon you have to pull out to cover murder, considering he's the one that approved of Stephen's murder. And he had a false sense of righteousness as well. He thought he was doing God a favor by killing Christians. I have a question for you. Because that's good. Does Jesus Christ ever say, come follow me? He does. Good. So the young man has a false sense of goodness, a false sense of righteousness. Verse 21, I kept these from my youth. <coughs> now, none of your parents are here. Thankfully, my parents aren't here. I'm, a, I'm sure that none of your parents would say, yeah, my kid was perfect. They kept all the commandments growing up. How many times did you spank them or give correction? Well, about that. I felt the rod of correction more than once on my rear end. For even small things as do not bear false witness. This young man has this set false sense of goodness, but what we see is he has a lack in goodness because did you notice the first commandment is not there in that list? Yep. In fact, Exodus records for us, it's also found in the book of Deuteronomy, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and you shall have no other gods 
before or we could understand it better besides me. Yes. They are one. You shall have no other gods besides me. I'm the only one. You want to break out in the tear song now, right? I'm the only one. But God is the only one. It's what makes him unique. Here's his first commandment. No other gods besides me. But what's the rich young ruler have? When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. So all that you have, and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Follow me. But when he had heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely, extremely rich. rich, with the implication being and he loved his money. Hence why he becomes sad, because Jesus says, Come, follow me. Some would take this passage as a uh, a method for social justice. I'm not sure how you get there from idolatry, but okay. Jesus does teach if you see your brother has need and then you don't do something about it. You don't really love your neighbor as yourself. But here he is talking to this ruler, this one who should know, this one who's been brought up in Israel. If his parents are doing what they're supposed to be doing according to the law, they're teaching him daily the law, the precepts, the commandments of God so that he would not depart from them. Jesus says, you still lack one thing. You've got a different God. Get rid of your God and follow me. One thing you still lack. You think you're good. You missed the first commandment there, young ruler. Verse 24 says, Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, then who can be saved? If a rich person can't buy their way into heaven or they are rich because God's blessed them because they're so good. Then who can really be saved? Who can have eternal life? But he, Jesus said, what? What is impossible with man is possible with God. See, no one is good but God alone. To reach that standard of good, you have to keep all the commandments. And let's face it. None of us have. And thus, to gain eternal life, to enter into the kingdom of God, it's impossible with man, but it's possible with God alone. Isn't that wonderful news? Jesus, seeing he had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. What we see is this principle that there is difficulty when wealth is your God. But it's not just wealth, is it? It happens to be this young man's thing. But we all have our own little gods that we love over God alone. Self, pride, much like Diotrephes in the third John, or this ruler here, his wealth. This thing that 
showed that he was, oh, he had it all. He was a ruler. He was in control. He had a position. We could even say those things combined, self was his God. In fact, you can hear the pride dripping off his words as he says, Oh, I've kept all these from my youth. I'm pretty good, Jesus. In fact, you kind of wonder if he comes up to him and says, Good teacher, and expecting him to go, Oh, good ruler, back to him. But no one is good but God. And there's great difficulty we could say even impossibility when it comes to man's point of view to enter the kingdom of God, especially when wealth is your God. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. John, the very writer who is writing the epistles we've been studying, is probably standing there hearing this. And Jesus teaches counterculturally for his day and ours. He says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Is treasure saying something important? Something important, something you value. I found this very important reason. My mom and I think I'm weird because I see a verse that says, Target, or these are on the back of it. It's in around 20. Jesus says where your treasure is, what you value, that's where your heart is. And what did God say back in Exodus? No other gods besides me. Sometimes we read the before, and that's an accurate translation, but we think, oh, if we have put God first, then we can have all our other things behind him. No. God's exclusive. In fact, Jesus, in verse 24 of chapter 6 in the book of Matthew, in the same section, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. money. But it's not just money. right? Everybody needs a little money to eat. Eat your house. The love of money is evil, the Bible tells us. But the love of anything be above Jesus Christ. In fact, in this very section, Jesus is teaching on discipleship that we're looking at in Luke chapter 18. In another passage, Jesus says, Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. In fact, in Luke chapter 10, a very another similar instance, a lawyer sent by the scribes stood up and put him to the test and said, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Does that sound familiar? And he, that is Jesus, said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? Right? You're a lawyer. Tell me what the law says. And he, that is a lawyer, answered, You shall love... <laughs> The Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and then your neighbor as yourself. And he, Jesus, said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. What's the first commandment? No other gods. What's this young man have but in front of God? <clears throat> this stuff. His pride, his position. When Jesus answered this young man, he went away sad. Those around him could not believe it. Who can be saved? Who can gain that eternal life? Who can have presence in the kingdom of God? It's impossible. What is impossible with man is possible with God. What we have to realize is we're like the young man. 
We may think we're good. But have you messed up on a commandment? If you say, no, I haven't, there's the first one. Pride, you put yourself before God. Who can be saved if not the good? If those who we think and hold up as, oh, they have good morals, oh, they, 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 they have success, so they must be being blessed by God. That was the mentality here of these people staying in the crowd. Oh, this is a rich young man. He's got it good. God must be blessing him. If he can't be saved, there's no way for us to. In fact, again, in Matthew... Jesus speaking, again, the Sermon on the Mount. He looks around as the crowds are there. And he says, for I tell you, unless your righteousness, your right standing before God, exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's impossible. Those scribes, the Pharisees, they're the ones that keep heaping up rules on us to protect us from God's law. They're the epitome of fine moral upstanding in our culture. But they replace God with their own interpretation, their own rules around the law. Jesus looks at the crowd and says, unless you have righteousness that's better than the Pharisees and the scribes, not that they're going to heaven, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. It's impossible for a man. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? Who can have this eternal life? Who can have a presence dwelling in the kingdom of God? Jesus said, but what is impossible with man is possible with God. Only through God can we be saved and have eternal life. Only when we have Jesus' robes, his robes for mine, because all of us are just sinners saved by grace. His robes for mine, what wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, Christ suffered neath God's rage. It's impossible for you and I to be good enough to meet the standard of God. Because none is good but God. None of us. Our righteousness does not exceed the scribes and Pharisees. I know because I'm just like you. I've not kept the law perfectly. I can't even get out of the top ten. The only way I have hope is Jesus Christ. Him giving me his righteousness and taking and having paid for my sin. And here to the young man he says, don't look back. Leave everything here. Come, follow me. Last week, John, in finishing his epistle, his third epistle, says, imitate good. Well, there's no good by God, so we are to imitate God. Jesus says, come, follow me. Come, be my disciple, imitate me. 
and he who is God thought not robbery to be equal or as God took on the form of flesh and humbled himself as Philippians tells us to die for our sins will you follow and mimic him by humbling yourself and asking him to forgive you of your sins once for all and have that wonderful exchange because none of us are good but God God alone and what would seem impossible for us is only possible with God will you accept what God has done for you if you have questions let us show you from the Bible the gospel Jesus Christ has died for you Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what Jesus has done. Even as we read last week and studied, we are to imitate good. And by doing so, we prove to not only having seen God, but Lord, really being in his family. there is none good except you alone we ask that any here who are trusting themselves their position their pride their religion that they are good would realize even as this young man did there is none good but God that they would give up their claims here. They would humble themselves and accept what Jesus Christ has done in dying for them, completely paying the price for their sin. And, exchange, and accept the wonderful exchange of his rose for theirs. So that they may one day be welcomed home into your kingdom as is realized fully both here as it is already in heaven. Only you, God, can work in hearts, convict us of our sin. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.